You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resensinski and I, Niels Karstulasen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. For those of you who are regular listeners, this podcast series is all about voicing our differences on the one topic that brings us all together, namely systematic investing, using the often overlooked but very robust strategy of trend following. We hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Rich, where we discussed some really fundamental questions like why trend following works, why trends occur in markets, and why it's best to exploit them using a systematic approach. And we also discussed the idea of doing trend following on trend following using the uh, TTU trend barometer. I would also encourage you to listen to the Wednesday episode, uh, where this week Kevin Coldiron spoke to Manoj Prathan. He's the author and founder of Talking Heads Macroeconomics, and where they discussed the structural forces that will drive markets in the future, based on his latest book, The Great Demographic Reversal, Aging Societies, Waning Inequality, and an Inflation Revival. They also covered the uh, demographics and how that has an impact on inflation and interest rates uh, historically and how it's likely to play out in the future. So if you missed any of those, I would really encourage you to go and listen to them. But of course, uh, not until you finish listening to Mark and I today. Mark, always great to be back with you. How are things uh, with you? It's another busy week in a year that just seems to go from one major event to another. So how are you doing? How are things where you are? No, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, up in uh, the Boston area, which is not as hot as the rest of the United States or as Europe. So in that sense, I'm, I'm keeping my cool in, uh, in during these crazy markets. I think a lot of people need to keep their cool it, also inside the, the the crazy markets, I have to say. But you're right. I mean, Europe has been pretty hot the last uh, few weeks. Um, so hopefully it's getting better as we head into uh, August soon. Although that's not typically the uh, coolest month of the summer, I have to say. Anyways, um, this was a week where after 11 years, the ECB finally joined the Global Rate Hike Central Bank Club. Uh, but in usual ECB fashion, somewhat changing their future forecast to leave the door open for not having to raise another 50 basis points again in their September meeting as previously indicated. Now, if we turn our attention to the US from an economic perspective, um, it was a pretty terrible week, especially for those in the housing sector. The NAHB housing index, housing starts and existing home sales all plunged, as did mortgage applications. Earnings reports started to pour in this week as well, uh, and they were not great. The banking sector categorically has seen a decline in earnings year over year, and they have begun to increase their provisions for loan losses as growth slows. A reflection of that slower growth uh, was seen in AT&T's earnings report. Despite beating expectations on the top and bottom lines, they said that they're, they're witnessing a material slowing in on-time bill payment. And as we close out, close out this week, investors' attention is focused on next week's Wednesday's FOMC meeting, of course, on the back of the Central Bank of Canada's 100 basis point surprise hike last week, pundits began to speculate that the Fed would follow suit. But as the anecdotal weakness continues to pour in this week, expectations has shifted back to a 75 basis points uh, rate hike and the possibility of a pause even at the September meeting. No doubt that investors will eagerly await the chairman's post-meeting comments. Let me bring you in, uh, Mark, here and just sort of get your thoughts and what's caught your attention uh, from a market or any other perspective that you uh, have been following the last few weeks. Well, I think that this last week, as you discussed, suggests that we have the continued trends, the fundamental trends that we have of, uh, of stagflation. And, you know, it's it's something that we talked about for the last two time, uh, times that I've been on uh, the podcast. But this is now there is a fundamental theme of stagflation that's hitting the uh, the globe. 
And what I've often talked about is, is that if there are fundamental trends, that it's going to lead to f- fundamental price movements. And so, so price trends are often driven by the fundamentals, and the fundamentals are not looking good. Now, I, I will sort of say that <laughs> I am always amazed at, at the ECB, where in some senses they talk about that we've really sort of stretched ourselves to go from negative 50 basis points, we do 50 basis points, to bring deposit rates to zero. <laughs> uh, and what we're going to do is, is in exchange for that, what we're going to do is we're not going to give you any forward guidance of what our plans are. We're only going to go meeting to meeting. So so it's, it's almost as though that we throw the market a bone of 50 basis points, but then we're going to come back and tell you that we can't tell you exactly what we're going to do at all. We can't give you any guidance whatsoever, but what our future might hold. <laughs> and and what makes it even more ridiculous, Mark, is the fact that obviously this is happening in the backdrop of, you know, almost 10% inflation, right? I mean, it's not like they haven't gotten any data to suggest that maybe, you know, even zero is a few big points away from where rates might have to go. And, uh, you know, a lot of the historical evidence is actually that interest rates end up going to where inflation is. So unless inflation really comes down a lot, uh, you know, interest rates have to come up um, significantly, certainly in Europe as well. So, um, yeah, just another kind of visualization of how different and difficult uh, the environment is, uh, and I really do understand why uh, investors uh, in general are kind of confused about the future. And even to some extent, what I hear anecdotally is that for some investors, this this whole kind of looking into the future in terms of how to invest and the the, the money they manage, um, it's it's kind of an existential question now because if you get it wrong, you, you can really get into trouble because a lot of people already have gotten the last six to 12 months significantly wrong in their portfolio allocation. Now, while, I, while I've chuckled about the ECB is that they are really in a rock to a hard place in the sense is, is that we're looking at a, a serious recession potential in Europe. You have a supply shock that a central bank has a really hard time sort of controlling this is more systemic of a longer term question is, is that they probably should have been raising rates before this. And so now that they're they're behind the curve and they're sort of hard to admit this. And then and then finally, as is that the, they've talked about their new anti-fragmentation theory or policy, which in some senses is that say we're raising rates 50 base points to take it to zero, but we're going to have the latitude to be able to, you know, print money whenever we want to buy bonds to keep prices where we think they should be, not where they may belong. Yeah. And 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 another thing was actually something you shared with, with me just before we pressed record today that also I think shows how you know, frankly, how silly the a lot of the politics are are at the moment in in Europe. You were you were sharing with me the fact that, and and as we know, German energy policy has certainly not uh, been been great in the last few years, and and you were sh- and and part of that has been, of course, the decision made to shut down all the nuclear plants, um, and and driving that agenda. Um, but now you were sharing with me that actually now they're considering just leasing those plants out to Poland. <laughs> Which obviously defies the purpose in the first place if they wanted to get rid of nuclear energy. I mean, it's crazy. Right. And, and this, uh, this is all part of the, uh, well, and we could talk a little bit more about, I think, regret. Uh, regret that investors have and policymakers have. And, and the regret is, is that you don't want to make a decision that then you think was wrong in the future. So you sl- make slower decisions or you make decisions that you think is going to uh, protect you from uh, from you know a bad outcome later on, and uh, sometimes that just doesn't work, and that creates the gradualism that leads to the price action that allows trend followers to to exist and to thrive. Yeah, well, we'll definitely come to that. Speaking of trend following strategies, obviously this week was. Probably a little bit of a continuation of what we've seen uh, lately, which is a kind of a period where we give back some of the uh, 
uh, recent performance that had been built up because uh, as we're getting more bad news, so to speak, on the economic front, of course, bond investors are interpreting that as good news. And that has led and inspired a bear market rally in all of the fixed income maturities against the longer term downtrend. That's clearly been hurting trend followers uh, this week or, or, or past weeks, I would say. Other sectors that most likely gave back us some, re- some of their recent gains um, this week was currencies due to the weaker dollar and maybe even meats and, and also some of the metals, uh, I would suspect. We may have seen some small gains in uh, sectors like soft, um, not, not least due to sugar, which had a big move, uh, as well as equities actually um, probably doing okay so far. The grain sector saw further weakness in price in light of the Ukraine and Russian agreeing to sign a deal to restart grain exports, according to Turkey. Um, and sending wheat and corn prices low on the futures markets. Uh, Of course, this is a good thing from a humanitarian perspective, as nobody wants to see famine spreading in the poorest country due to the war in Ukraine. But again, something we spoke about uh, off air is that there are lots of uncertainties about, you know, how this will actually end up being implemented and and actually shipped out of Odessa uh, as long as the war continues to, to rage in that area. When I look at the industry numbers, you know, clearly that so far uh, July looks like a down month, which is completely normal after a a strong run uh, of performance. Um, And it's also confirmed by my trend barometer, which closed yesterday at 36, which is a weak reading. Uh, Specifically, the beta 50 index as of Thursday was down 1.17% for the month, still up 15% or so for the for the year. Sokjian CT index down about 80 basis points for the month, uh, up 20% uh, for the year. The trend index from Sokjian down 1.31% for the month, uh, up 27% uh, for the year. And the short-term traders index actually still up 20 basis points for the month and up for, uh, 11 and a half for the year. And that compares to the MSCI World Index, which is finally having a, a positive month up 4% or so, but still down 18% for the year. And the World Government Bond Index for the first time in a long time actually up for the month up about 80 basis points. Um, so... That's where we stand. And yesterday, Friday, was not, in my, uh, as far as I can tell, a good uh, day for trend followers. I already I- imagine that most uh, CTAs and trend followers gave back uh, further performance uh, yesterday. All right, Mark, we've got um, some great topics that you brought along. Thanks for that. Um, before we hit to them, there's a couple of questions that came in that uh, I'd love to uh, to share with you and, and, and let's see what we can do in terms of providing some meaningful answers. The first one came in from Alp. Alp wrote, uh, writes, um, I hope you're well. Thank you very much for conducting these podcasts. They are informative and fun to listen to. An established CTA may use 15 to 30% margin to equity, which may lead to many multiples of notional leverage. In your podcast with Rich last week, you discussed that for a trend trader, the real risk of the portfolio can be determined in relation to where you place your maximum stop loss instead of notional leverage. As a new trend trader myself, though, I would like to understand how you and your guests view the possibility of a systemic risk. A systemic risk may happen where markets are closed uh, a couple of days due to a black swan event similar to the Great Depression in the 1920s and an unforeseen attack like 9-11. And when markets open, there are large potential moves where prices gap up or gap down, leading to potential bankruptcies among major leveraged banks and hedge funds. Trading with a high notional leverage for a trend trader may indicate such a systemic risk is not a concern either, because such an event has not happened in the history of financial markets or else trend trader could manage such a low probability event with buying out of the money options, uh, which will cost very little to ensure that you hedge against an event like that where prices gap up or gap uh, down significantly in such a low probability event. It's also possible to buy specialist insurance coverage to hedge um, for such a risk due to low probability assigned to it. Such an insurance will not be expensive. I'd love to understand how you and your guest would manage systemic risk and possibility of large price gaps as a result of such an event. All right, let's dive into that a little bit, Mark, and hear your thoughts on 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 this 
part of our risk management, so to speak? Right. Well, the first thing is that systemic risk is real. And throughout my career, I've actually seen systemic risk events. Uh, I think that we've seen them in 2008. We've seen them in uh, 1987 during the market crash. We've seen banking crisis uh, ir- around the world over the last 20, 30 years. So you have to accept that the systemic risk is a reality uh, it is not uh, events that only happen once every hundred hundred years. And when you think of systemic risk is different than volatility of markets, because the, what you're seeing is, is that there'll be a breakdown of the underlying system. So the question is not whether the prices will move, it's whether prices will actually just, will we be able to get a price at all? Will we be able to trade? So consequently, is is that you always want to sort of control your overall exposure to the markets, regardless of whether you could be able to lever up more. So a margin is is not is is actually a performance bond. The margin is set by the exchange, and it's supposed to represent a certain amount of movement in in price that would cover the uh, the likelihood that you would need to be able to put more money up as a performance bond. If there's a systemic risk, then it's quite possible that we may not be able to, or the exchange may not be able to get the cash from one side of the trade to be able to then move to people on the other side of the trade because for every buyer, there's a seller. So so if, if let's say one person is losing margin money, then someone else is gaining. And what we've known in, for example, in 1987, the, the problem at, at the 87 crash on that Monday night, because I was actually working for the CME, was whether banks would actually be able to move the money from one bank to another to m- meet the margin requirements. And therefore, if, if let's say that you, you were long, price fell, this is that, that you needed to post more margin. Well, that margin was then going to go to the shorts. The shorts would then be able to use that money to be able to pay off any of the uh, cash flows that were, uh, that were needed on their side. If there is a systemic risk or a failure in the banking system, then what we're going to sort of see that those people who might owe margin in the 87 crash or on the long, long side would not be able to give it to those on the short side. So consequently, is is that you always have to sort of uh, think that this is a possibility. And, in, and so consequently, you want to limit the overall leverage that you take. Another example would be is this is at the 9-11 event. So, so after 9-11, the markets were closed down to treasury markets. So so even though the, the treasuries are the safest assets in the world, there was no trading whatsoever, even, even in, in for cash or cash equivalent in, in the treasury market. So you have to expect that that is a possibility. And so therefore you need to limit your overall uh, exposure. And we'll sort of say when everyone says, well, and, and this is a, a separate question, but everyone said, well, what's your margin equity ratio? And I'd often sort of say that we say, well, margin equity ratio is about 15%. And they say, well, what are you doing with the other 85 cents on the dollar if you're using, you know, that 15 cents? Aren't you not using that money? Why don't you put it to use? And so we have to have a long conversation about just because you have the ability to be able to margin or to lever up more of your portfolio, that doesn't mean that you should use it. So what we always do is we'd sort of say, here is the volatility that we would like to have for our portfolio. And from that, we would determine exactly what is the margin that is needed. And then the the exchange would say, this is what you have to post. So we would sort of say, we start with what is the volatility I would like to have for the fund, accounting for market movements and systemic risk, and then back out uh, or be told what is the margin that's required for that. And that might be something far less than uh, you know, 30%. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a, a, a couple of really important points. Um, uh, I Interestingly enough, I had the conversation with Alan a couple of weeks ago about uh, return stacking and then, you know, using your excess cash to to do other things to kind of improve your your returns. And I think what you 
pinpoint there is is important, right? Because the more cash we put to work, you could say uh, potentially the more vulnerable we might be to a systemic risk event. Um, you know, so that's one thing. Um, I think that, I mean, and, and luckily you and I are old enough in this industry to have tried many different um, uh, types of risk. That is not to say that we won't encounter another one we have never tried. I'm sure we will. Um, but there's one thing that uh, has made me very um, comfortable uh, with trend following um, and, and a couple of things in particular. One is that the futures markets that we operate in, and this is also why I'm I'm often saying that I'm not a big fan of CTAs and trend followers moving off exchange um, because I do think you introduce another level of risk. Um, but but I do think that we've we've seen on multiple occasions that the futures markets have remained probably the most liquid of the markets, even through some of these crises where you would think that something like currencies or treasuries would be the most liquid. But actually, we've had a couple of occasions where even those uh, type of markets uh, kind of froze or where the volume became very, very uh, low and where futures seems to have uh, done um, a, a much better job in that. This is also why Unfortunately, trend followers and CTAs are often used as the cash machine or the ATM uh, during a crisis because a lot of other strategies can't b- become liquid as, as quickly as they need to. So that's one thing. I think the other th- way we generally handle uh, systemic risks uh, is, of course, through diversification. And this is why we we so often refer that as to a really important part of what we do is that we take relatively small uh, bets uh, in many markets. And of course, um, that does support the theory about having, um, uh, you know, quite a few markets in in your portfolio that you trade. However, uh, we also have to recognize that a lot of these markets are traded on the same exchange. So clearly, if CME Group has a, is closed uh, for an unforeseen event, then we're all, we're going to be we not not able to trade quite a few of the markets we trade today. So this you you can't completely minimize that risk to zero. It's impossible. It's it's there, but I think CTAs uh, and trend followers we do a pretty good job at mitigating it as much as is reasonably possible. I, I actually do think that closure of, of exchanges, I mean, we've even seen it this year with nickel, right? That closed for a few days because of an event earlier on on the LME exchange. So for, for a few markets to be closed extraordinary for a few days, I think we can handle that. But if all exchanges that we trade suddenly close for some much more global reasons, um, then, then of course you, do, you there's a risk, but there's going to be a risk with all investments at that point, not just what we do. Um, but it's a good point. Um, well, the the issue with the LME and the nickel trading is uh, is the is a poster child for systemic uh, risk. Here is the exchange, so it's a a large price move. They didn't have price limits. So then they go back and they say, we're going to shut down the exchange and we're going to cancel the trades that actually occurred uh, so that you you had a transaction that was legally binding that was on the exchange following all the rules. They said, well, no, we're going to cancel that out. So so that so that's the systemic risk with the exchange itself. There's also the greater risk is when you talked about OTC is that a lot of nickel trading was done over the counter but it was priced off the LME. So, so what happens is a bank would do a, some type of uh, you know, swap with you. So it'd be priced on the LME or priced against the LME. But then at the same time, this is that your counterparty was a bank. So uh, now, why did they do this? Because the bank might you know, lend, uh, lend money to the uh, underlying hedger. But you have this the situation where you you can actually have a bank that goes under because the, their risk is different than what the uh, what the exchange risk. The exchange is actually always offsetting a buyer with a seller, and they're just serving as a clearinghouse in the middle to be able to warehouse margin money. A bank is in a different situation, and so consequently, is is that. You, you should always ask a question. This is that oftentimes with uh, we'll call it uh, swap lookalikes from banks, 
the margin that they would ask is sometimes less than what you get on the exchange. So, so, so is there an inherent risk if a bank, which is a single institution, will give you better terms than the exchange? That, that means they're pricing that risk differently, and that's potential a, a system, a systemic risk. And I think this issue, which you talked about with on the um, cash stacking of what you do with the excess cash, is really important because it's something that every CTA has talked about. You know, you know, I, I've talked about okay, how do we get a little bit extra money on that extra cash? Because you know, if let's say I could get an extra, if my management fee is one percent, and if I could get an extra one percent on my cash that's not being held at the exchange. And let's say that's 85% of the total cash, I could basically pay for my management fee or, or I could offset the, the cost of the management fee for the client by you know increasing the yield. But then you ask the question is, is that if I'm a trend follower, but I'm using my excess cash as a short-term bond surrogate or doing something else with it, am I still a trend follower? Or am I an overlay manager on a bond portfolio? So, so these are questions that an investor should ask, but at the same time, that also changes the risk complexion of what that CTA is. Yeah, and 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 I certainly um, discussed. Um, I think maybe it was with Rich last week or or with Alan a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I don't think we as CTAs are being paid for taking a certain risks. I mean, we're being paid for making money from trends, um, but there are certain risks I don't think we should get involved in. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, and and also, as you said, I mean, I do remember back in 2008 uh, when banks uh, were, um, you know, simply uh, going bankrupt and you didn't really know which bank was next. And there certainly was a few European banks that got into severe trouble and I remember running a, a CTA back then where we had lots of cash sitting. Back then, it was more normal to just have your excess cash sitting at a bank. But suddenly you realize that, oh, that is a risky proposition. And you had to start using these uh, short-term uh, fixed income um, products that were at least guaranteed by some government of some sort, right? Like treasuries or whatever. So, um, but, so, so these things... Um, we kind of think about new risks that we need to manage as we see a crisis and we learn from that. But I think even with some of the brokerage firms that went belly up like MF Global and stuff like that, I think generally speaking, I think it is correct that those who were trading futures were eventually held or, or made whole so that they didn't lose anything. So I think that the, the way futures exchanges work and, and how that's been structured and set up, and maybe it's not perfect yet, but it is quite robust, I would say, uh, and obviously keeping um, our money essentially on segregated client accounts, meaning that it's not part of the of the uh, assets of, of the um, of the clearing firm that you're using, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's some important uh, lessons, and it, but it's still an evolution, I'm sure. Right. And it also is a lesson, is it, for all investors, is, is that you expect that you will be protected by the exchange. You'll be expected that you'll be protected by the bank. You'll be expected to be protected by the courts. And the answer is, for all three of those, the answer is no. Uh, you know, being involved with the MF Global issue is, is that there is an issue of who had jurisdiction and they decided that instead of having the jurisdiction be the CFTC, there was then going to be the SEC, which has a different set of rules. And so the, the, the rules that you believed you were under, which was associated with the CFTC, which meant is, is that you would have segregated accounts for your, you know, for, you know, your margin money did not apply because they had a different jurisdiction in the bankruptcy, which caused a tremendous amount of, you know, pain and, and heartache. I will sort of say that because of systemic risk is, is that that could spill over to prices in ways that people don't expect. And so, for example, this is that if I feel that there is a higher level of systemic risk and I have excess margin in my margin account at my broker or my my clearing bank, what I'll do is I'll pull the money because you want to sort of sweep money as fast as possible away from whatever the systemic risk is, which then in itself could cause a crisis because you could get a feedback loop. So 
so I think that uh, there was a part of the question too is where the uh, the person said, "Well, I could buy an insurance contract." Well, one of the biggest insurance insurers in the mortgage market in two thousand eight was AIG. It went bankrupt. So, uh, so, so the mortgage insurers, the actually the uh, underwriters, often of those they actually f- f- failed or they had to be recapitalized. So, uh, and even uh, we'll say that uh, Fannie and Freddie, uh, Freddie Mac, which uh, you know is the aggregator of mortgages, is sort of, they don't offer protection per se, but they're as the aggregator and 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 they sort of set up the. Uh, the mortgage market made it much easier for investors to buy. They said they went into receivership in September of 2008. So institutions can fail, and you need to be able to be uh, prepared for that and aware of that and, and expect it. Yeah, and let me just finish this off because we we do want to move on to the next question. But let me just finish off because actually um, two things you said that are really uh, triggered my mind here. And, and that is, of course, that there is one more level now that we've seen in terms of, um, you know, things that might uh, avoid or bail out a crisis. And that is, of course, governments, because we have seen, quote unquote, governments step in and, you know, decide essentially which banks got saved or not saved, et cetera, et cetera. This is why we have these systemic, uh, you know, sy- systemically, I can't even remember what they call them now, systemic banks or whatever it's called. So so that's another level, actually, and um, where we saw people like Bear Stearns and, and to some extent go under, uh, and, and of course also Lehman, which was uh, the big one. So that's one thing. But actually the question that we were asked, which I've completely forgotten about, was whether you could put buy uh, out-of-the-money options or whether you can even sign, you know, uh, have a an insurance. And all I would just say, Alp, I don't think that's a good uh, viable way of doing it. I think you need to manage your risk in, uh, in a different way. I don't think you can continue to hedge uh, without it being exp- e- 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 very expensive. Um, because for for the most time, you you don't need it, right? For for ninety nine percent or point nine, you're not going to need all of these uh, hedges and insurances, and I think it's going to drag on your returns. So I think you you have to accept that there will be certain risks that you can't fully hedge. It's part of the strategy. It's part of why you're able to make a return. Um, so so that would just to answer your question specifically about uh, those that you raised. Right. The yeah. the ultimate hedge. Self-insure by hold cash. So hold some cash right. back. Is so because if, yeah. if you try to do an insurance policy or an option out of the money, you're still at risk with the institution that you'll be is your counterparty. Yeah. Okay. Good point. All right. We have another question, um, and this one is from Algernon. And he writes, "Hello again, Nils. Thanks for featuring my question on your episode with Rob Carver a couple of weeks back." Another thing I was thinking may be a good uh, to discuss in your podcast was about portfolio construction using trend-following funds. Currently, my portfolio has quite a few sectors uh, represented, and I was hoping it would be va- a valid thing to replace some of these with trend-following and just have a simple equity, cash, gold, and trend-following type construction. At the moment, I've been shifting between commodities and bonds over the last year, which has paid off quite nicely, but it would be much less hassle to let a CTA funds do this for me. However, I haven't seen a day I haven't seen the data that explain why it's more preferred to let CTA or trend-following funds replace bonds and commodities in a portfolio whilst leaving equities represented. Is there established thinking about this, um, uh, why this is? I've seen the Dragon portfolio, which does uh, still feature bonds, even though they're covered by trend follow- the trend following part of the portfolio. And again, I'm not sure why this would be. Any thoughts on this, Mark? Well, equities is always viewed as your, your core position in your portfolio. Equities should move with the overall growth rate of, uh, of, of the economy. And so in some senses, that what are you trying to do when you buy trend following or diversify? You're trying to protect yourself from uh, what we call consumption risk. And consumption risk is, is that you want to have an invest, uh, let's, let's say, you're looking for an investment that will move up with your consumption pattern, move up with the economy. But then when you know that there's going to be a downturn, then that uh, a recession, that's going to put your consumption at risk. So you would like to have assets that are diversified 
from equities. And that's what trend following does. So so we always start with the core of equities and then, uh, and then move around it. I will sort of say that there are some CTAs that have actually experimented or work with and implicitly that they'll have a core equity portfolio and then they'll trade trends and other markets around it. They look like they have a better return to risk than a pure trend follower, and partially because they're just getting the diversification of a, of equities that are uncorrelated with the trend following program. Yeah, and I think I think uh, Algernon that you know kind of just taking a step back and look at what it might be that makes a kind of a dragon type portfolio uh, interesting. Um, at the end of the day, I think you're trying to find assets. Um, if we also classify trend following as an asset class, even though a lot of people would say it's not, but let's just call it that to keep it simple. You know, find different types of assets for your portfolio that has uh, different return patterns uh, depending on what regime you're in. So, of course, we know equities long term uh, has yielded uh, whatever it is, 8%. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to yield 8% in the next 20 years. We don't know. I mean, there's no set law to say that it has to happen, right? But we, but over many different regimes, um, they have done well. You could say the same with bonds. It's just the fact that the last 10 years and maybe the next few years, they're not going to be in a particular good environment for bonds if interest rates uh, are moving higher. But if you're looking at a 50-year horizon or a 100-year horizon, it probably makes sense to have bonds in there, partly because of it is um, something that can yield you a return, um, but also partly because it can be viewed as a quote unquote safe asset. Now, I think a lot of us will have to reevaluate what we mean by a safe assets after what we've seen now um, bonds deliver, uh, given the low uh, interest rate environment we've been in, which is, of course, is to use a, a, a terrible phrase, unprecedented um, for most of us. Um, and, and then <laughs> then you have cash. Again, it serves the purpose, not necessarily to give you a great return, but it could be just for, for um, a margin of safety, so to speak. And then you have, you mentioned gold. Well, again, if you go back and you look at gold's return, it may not be the best return. Um, I, I don't know what it is actually, but it may not be the best return. But I think a lot of people think that if the whole world blows up, gold will be one of those assets that will still remain. Now, I don't want to get into the discussion about physical gold versus "quote unquote" electronic gold uh, mutual funds and ETFs, but but just in general, so it has a certain purpose and it it makes money in in a certain regime. Now, what I love about trend following, uh, and I know you obviously would expect me to say that, is that I actually think trend following is. Um, because it is adaptive and because it is diversified, I actually think trend following generally tends to work in in a more um, in a wider range of different regimes. Um, there will be some where it doesn't work, um, but as a kind of quote unquote more consistent uh, with return driver uh, in a portfolio. Um, because even though equities might be relatively consistent, it is dependent on a certain regime. For example, it's not going to like stagflation, for example. So if we're heading into stagflation, don't expect your equity portfolio to do great the next whatever period uh, of time. But I think with trend following, we have more, um, basically more strings to play on. And so even though people don't think of trend following returns as being very consistent, I actually think of them as being consistent within their uh, kind of risk return profile and and so i think that's the most important part and i'm not you ask whether you should have bonds and commodities replaced by trend following i think with with commodities for sure simply for the reason that commodities as a long only portfolio uh, investment i think i don't think it's a great uh, it's a it's not a great one because you're going to have some periods with very strong returns and you're going to have very long periods with quite negative returns. At least that's what history suggests. So I'm not a big fan of long-only commodities per se. Uh, I think trend following where we can be long and short commodities, uh, as proven this year so far, where we've both been long, and now in some commodities we're short and also making money from that, I think that's a much better bet. I don't think that trend following per se replaces bonds. I, I don't think we do. Um, so I would keep bonds as a 
component. You can either decide to have it or not, but I don't think we are replacing bonds in any shape or um, except if you are referring to what Rich and I did, where we said, well, actually in a 60-40 portfolio, you can have a portfolio trend followers be the 40. I agree with that, though. So maybe you are referring to that. Uh, now that I think about it, and 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 from that point of, uh, point of view, it it could make sense because we obviously have some exposure to fixed income inside the trend following part, but not just from a long only uh, perspective. Right. The, the key point is, is that what is the regime that you're in? So, you know, bonds were a great investment to have when we looked at uh, long bonds were way up above double digits starting in 1981. And they've come back down to virtually in short term rates have come down to zero. So that was a great a trade and 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 you uh, that gave you a a great uh, tailwind to hold bonds. Now we're in a you know it let's say European inflation rates is eight point six percent or 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 higher depending on how how you measure it, and we just raised the deposit rates to zero. That's less of a good trade. So so in, in that sense, the regime now suggests this is that trend following would be a good uh, substitute for bonds world will change so we can't if we if we're on this podcast 25 years from now we might have a different answer <laughs> yeah absolutely so do bring it up in 25 years Algonon, if we're, if we're still doing this uh, every weekend all right um i hope those uh questions got answered with some helpful perspectives from from mark and i now we're going to move on to Mark's uh, topics, uh, where again, I don't know where he's going to go with these uh, as, as usual. So um, I will uh, do my best to uh, to catch up and uh, and see where we go. But the first topic you wanted to talk about was really kind of global macro binary world. Where, where are we heading with this? Well, you know, one of the, let's, let's start with the question you asked me that the last meeting was, is it, why, you know, why, uh, why do trend followers make money? And it's not from like, what markets do we make money, but why do we make it fundamentally? And, and that's a, a theme that we always go back to for a lot of our conversations. We're either, we're either going to be micro, okay, here's how you implement trend following models. And here's how you sort of manage the portfolio. Or we often have the conversation is macro and macro is, is it, well, why does this particular strategy make sense and works? So, and, you know, we've talked about this in terms of, well, fat tails. So this is it. We've got, you know, we, we move to the tails and you so say you want to hold a, a large portfolio because you never know when you're going to go to the, uh, go to the tail. And then we've also talked about convergence and divergence is that the market di- di- diverge and you can exploit the divergence in markets through trend following. And so, you know, I'm trying to look at the environment today and say, well, why was trend following so successful? And then what it really came to the conclusion is, is that it's because a lot of the decisions or the thought processes or narratives or themes that we've been discussing have been very binary in the sense is, is that, you know, geopolitical risk war, it's either on or off, either we're having war or we're going to have peace. And so because that markets are going to react to either one extreme or another. So, uh, and especially if it looks like the Ukraine-Russia war might last longer. But initially, we often thought about this is that it's going to be very fast. It's either one side is going to win or it's not going to happen. And COVID is either it was on and then it was off. So so again, it was very binary. And, and so now we're sort of thinking, well, we might have to live with COVID, you know, 24 seven all the time. But before is the last two years, it's been a very binary choices. Even inflation has been somewhat binary. Is it, it, well, it's transitory, it's not gonna last, or someone said, it's gonna be very persistent. Uh, we've now talked about, you know, uh, recession. It's, it's either gonna be a soft landing, hard landing. It's gonna be short, it's gonna be long. And so uh, central bank policy, we're either dovish or hawkish. We go from one extreme to another. And when you think about a binary world and you think about when people internalize or act on this binary world, then they're going to move to one extreme of a distribution to the other. So they go back and forth. And so what happens to prices in between? Well, they're going to have to move between and, and that's what actually creates trends. And so when we're in a binary world, macro world, then we're probably going to have more price movements 
And because of that, there's going to be more opportunity for, for trend following. And so uh, even when we look at commodities, it was, it was let's say, the last year up until about March, it was as that we're in a new super cycle. We're going to be short everything. You know, we're, 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 we're going to run out of every good we can think of. We're going to be starving and we're going to be freezing. And we'll probably sort of say in the last three months or especially the last two months, now we're sort of saying is that, well, we're actually going into a recession. And so we're going to have an overabundance of everything. And so so every, every price is going down. So when you think about a world being binary, then you're going to have more extreme movements in price. And so consequently, is, is, is that those prices are usually not going to get there immediately. So consequently, that's where we're, we're going to see uh, potential for, for trends. So, yeah, I think that's a great, I mean, actually, I think that's a very simple but elegant way of thinking about it. Um, not something I would necessarily have thought about myself in the sense when you describe it, when you listen to the to the rhetoric, when you listen to the narrative, you're right. It's actually almost always an extreme of either too much supply or you know too much demand, uh, and and it's either fantastic or it's, or it's really terrible. And of course, when you look at then, uh, you know, who are making these decisions, right? Not to just blame the politicians, but you know, as we talked about earlier, some of the decisions that are being made right now in terms of energy. Uh, in Germany, for example, I mean, it's just kind of crazy stuff that you can't make up uh, in terms of how silly uh, some of these, how would silly is not the right word I'm looking for, but they could have planned this much better, let's put it this way, and managed it much better than some of these decisions that are being taken that seem very short term and kind of panicky uh, at the moment. So yeah, I mean, that is a very good reason as to um, you know why trend following has has a role to play in in these markets. Well, and how does this play out in actual behavior? Because it will sort of say that we can live in a binary world, which I think we do. And and now sometimes it becomes less binary. We're probably less binary now because I think that most people would agree that we're having a global slowdown. We're going to be in a recession now. The issue is what's the length and depth. Uh, so, so we, we, you know, over time that level of binariness actually dissipates. So, uh, but now we're in a, uh, and we faced also in the 2022, an issue that most investors are not worried about losses as much as they're worried about regret. Now, that doesn't mean that we're worried uh, that we don't feel the pain of losses, but when you're making a decision, it's almost as though that when you decide whether, well, should I get out of equities? The issue is, is that in a binary world, you say like, well, if I get out now and then the market continues to go higher, I really look like a fool. I'm going to have a lot of regret. So what happens is that you slow your decision. You buy dollar cost average out of it because you're afraid of making the decision of saying you're going to regret if you get it wrong. And so if people become more gradualists because they want, don't want to suffer from regret, what should happen to prices? The price adjustment process is going to be slower. It's not going to happen as fast as what we think it should. So consequently, this is it. That's what trend following is doing. And, you know, a story that I often get, gave is, is, is that, uh, uh, you know, about this is, is that, uh, you know, I was ha having a meeting and we were said, we talked about, we traded grains. And so one of the investors said like, well, why do you think that you could make money in grains when there are the big, uh, you know, grain companies, you know, uh, Bungie, General Mills, you know, sort of uh, Cargill. He says, they're a lot smarter than you. So and, uh, how could you make money uh, doing this? And I said, you know, uh, you're right. Every one of those uh, firms are smarter than I am, Okay but they may not make all of their decisions at the same time. They might be gradualists. And so my job is to, is to draft, you know, behind them and, and extract a signal and trade that trend that they might be actually be creating. I don't have to be the smartest person in a room. I just have to 
follow the smart people in the room and be a close follower. So, uh, and they often talk about, uh, you know, first mover advantage. This, this is it. And there is such a thing as a first mover advantage, but you also find in a lot of corporate st- and business strategy that the first mover advantage doesn't really exist. Sometimes you want to be a close second. So a perfect example is, is that uh, there are first mover advantages when we think about the internet. You know, uh, AOL had a, had a first mover advantage. I don't know if that worked out so well for the, for them. So a trend follower is is is, is sort of a close second mover. So uh, and so consequently, is is that because of gradualism, because of regret, and this even applies to central banks and their behavior then that creates friction in the in the markets this friction causes trends and that's what we're trying to exploit and that's also exactly why um, we use all of these different um ways of building up our confidence in our signal that we don't get in uh with all of our risk uh you know in one go we we build it up we are gradualists at extremes in in in, in the sense of how we build up our positions and that is of course I'm sure a result of once you do your testing and and all of that, uh, it fits well to what you just explained in terms of how the decisions are being made, and that's kind of how we then reflect in our entries and our and our exits. Um, so yeah, and and we'll sort of say that what I'm really surprised by markets is when I get the binary decision wrong, and and right. so I often look at this. Uh, so so when I look at the end of the week, I try to sort of say. What surprised me this week? You know, what did I think at the be- on Monday that I thought was going to happen? And then what did I, what actually happened when I'm sitting on Saturday having my morning coffee? And then I sort of say, and why did I get that wrong? And how could I have done this better? And, and eventually, this is the reason why I follow trends as sort of the base strategy, or this is why we have trends. Because if I followed trends, sometimes... I usually would have been better off than if I followed, you know, sort of my notions of how the macro world operates. So a perfect example, we'll sort of say, is is, is, it, uh, is the grain markets. So uh, because it's it's so obvious, this is that. So we still have a war in, in uh, between Russia and Ukraine. We still have not seen any of the grain move out of the Ukraine and out of the Black Sea. And yet you look at, we're in a major bear market in, in wheat, soybeans, and, uh, and corn. You have record heat, uh, some of it in, in the uh, uh, Midwest, albeit it's been not in the main you know, corn belt or whatever. So, but you know, prices have still, uh, still declined. And so at the end of the day, as you say, when you think about the binary world, if, uh, if, if my worldview is, is that Yes, we've got a war. We're going to have shortages. We have logistic problems. So therefore, prices should go higher or stay high. But in reality, the world has actually discounted something else. The binary, the price binary is, is that we're going to be in a recession and we're going to have excess supply. And so in some sense, I would have been better off if I just followed the price action as opposed to trying to draft or find the binary narrative that exists in the market today. Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's, it's completely, completely true. Um, Mark, you touched on a, quite a few things here in, 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 in this one. So I don't know when I look at the list of topics that you wanted to, uh, that you wanted to bring up, I don't know if we've touched on more than the first one. Um, so maybe you can have a quick look and see where we're going to go next. Um, right. Well, and, and I think we could save some of these for the, for the uh, next time. But uh, I was re- recently having a conversation when, along with this idea of surprise. This is, is it uh, uh, often sort of said like, well, why do you follow price or why are you always looking at the price action? And I, I, I use the phrase, I let prices speak for themselves. So in -hmm. some senses that you could listen to the radio or listen to TV, talk to the talking heads, you could read analysts. And so in some sense, they're speaking for the market, those analysts. They're sort of giving you their interpretation. When in reality is that sometimes you should just let prices speak for themselves. Prices could do a pretty good job of telling you what 
you know, is going on in the market. And so, so what a trend follower is doing is saying, I allow the prices to speak for themselves. I will follow what that prices as an analyst is doing. So I'm not going to listen to a talking head or I'm not going to listen to a single individual. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let the prices do the speaking. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think actually I feel rightly or wrongly, I do feel that there is a higher acceptance of this uh, coming through the last maybe since the pandemic started, because I think a lot of people were surprised with some of the financial market responses, uh, like the massive bull market we saw in equities, where a lot of people thought, how can that possibly happen? We're in the middle of a pandemic. And and where, again, where the quote-unquote fundamentals uh, were very hard to fit to the price action. So I do think that there has been a little bit of a, um, a revival of the acceptance of price action as a really important and powerful uh, tool. Um, obviously, something we've believed in for, for many decades. Um, the question will be, of course, again, you don't want to be too clever uh, when it comes to following price action, which is why we always advocate the trend following uh, e You know, is simple. It's not easy, but it is simple in concept. Because again, if you start putting too many uh, fancy tools uh, into your model, uh, then maybe some of that rawness, some of that, um, the strength of trend following actually disappears. So I don't know, maybe it's just me feeling that, or, or do you see the same that there's among your clients that there's been a little bit more of a, um, that they see now maybe what we've been seeing for, for many decades, the value of what trend following brings. Right. Well, I think that people who are trend followers have seen this for a long time and then will sort of say that there's been tremendous validation in the last the last year. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes from an investor's perspective, is that I've had the conversations where, you know, you sort of see that they've seen strong performance from trend following. And, you know, the the people who would sort of say, I don't want to have anything to do with trend following two, three years ago, sort of said, I got to get me some of that right now, <laughs> you know, and 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 so this is what causes the problems with with styles. Is is that you sort of say performance has been very good, money has been flowing into trend following. Some of it has been under the idea as well. I got to get trend following because they also has commodities. We're we're having a strong commodity bull market. I want I want to have that right right now and. You know, there's going to be some bumps in the road. I think that there has been, you know, uh, some give back in performance to some managers. Some uh, some of the trend followers have done a good job of being able to switch from long to short in some of the, many of the commodity markets. But we're going to sort of see that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of hot money has come in near the top. And as, when, as we've talked about this binary world, is this is that what happens is, is that as markets sort of adjust and adapt, you're going to have some give back period. You're going to have some flattening. We're going to have a period of sort of uh, maybe not calmness, but there are going to be some market of sideways movement. And and that means is that trend followers will have to reload, readjust their portfolio. And investors who come in late, you know, may not like the fact that there's going to be this adjustment process and there might be some give back. Yeah, no, of course, uh, that is very true. I will say, however, on a, on a, a more um, upbeat note, I would say um, that I think there has been a lot of uh, changes already in exposure within trend following portfolios. Um, and it hasn't cost a lot of money from in terms of give back so far. I mean, July is really the first month where we may see some give back. Um, but it's not it's not a it's not a lot uh, so far. Um and so I think that is uh, also because we're seeing more divergence in the markets, meaning that some sectors have actually transitioned from long trades to short trades, and it hasn't really hurt the overall portfolio because other sectors have been doing fine and, and et cetera. I do hope, um, and, and I agree with you, there, there will be, have been some quote-unquote hot money that has come in uh, near the highs maybe, but I do think that a lot of investors, uh, are, you know, have those who have dipped their toes into trend following, given what they've seen in the last year or so, I think they, and I hope they have more firepower. So when there is a correction, uh, that they will continue to add to their portfolios. And I think when we do see those corrections, I mean, maybe some of those who are sitting on the sideline saying, yeah, maybe I missed it because it's gone up so much in 2022. 
maybe that will then be the time for them to to step in uh, and and get some exposure to trend following because as both you and I know, um, this is not going to end here. This is just you know one regime change we've been into, but the uh, core concept of trend following and 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 the need for that to be a core part of any portfolio obviously is not going to change uh, even when some of these geopolitical issues may or may not be resolved. Right, and it's important for investors to realize is that the the idea of mean reversion. In, for a trend following portfolio is very different and very abstract relative to a long only portfolio. So you could sort of say if a long only equity portfolio hold it, there's really strong performance, there might be a give back. So, so but you know, for a trend follower, that concept is uh, doesn't doesn't even make sense because what happens is is that there is no such thing as truly as a give back. You might re, uh, give back some of a trade, but as a strategy overall, there, you could actually have make money on the upside, and then when markets reverse, you could make money on the on the downside. A perfect example is commodities. This is that most of the trend followers made a lot of money on the long side. There was a little bit of give back because there was a transition to a short position, and now they've gotten short, and they're making money back on the other side. So, so this is what good trend following does. It, it's not as though you're a long only commodity investor; you're a long short investor, and so therefore you don't have the same concept of mean reversion that you would as if you're a long only investor. Yeah, and that actually goes exactly to the point I mentioned earlier today when we talked about commodities and why I'm skeptical about the value of long-only commodities in a portfolio because it, it's so much depend on the timing of your investments rather than the fact that it's a long-term great investment to hold on to uh, for sure. What else do you want to bring up, Mark, before we wrap up uh, from your long list of, of topics that we, we're not going to get to today necessarily? Or maybe we did touch on well, most some of them. I think sure. I want to talk about ensemble modeling because that's a, that's a very micro and there's sure. preponderance of metrics. But we could say that for our, our, our next uh, chat. But the one that I wanted to talk about because it's most relevant is is that and and I'm not the person who coined the phrase, but I read it and I I, I sort of said that I, I love it is is that people have now talked about there's something called the Powell call as opposed to the Greenspan put. It's so okay. so uh, and I think that this is something that for for you know uh, investors to think about. So it used to be that there is always the view that the Fed provided a downside protection for equity markets as a Greenspan put. I remember one CTA allocator had a dartboard of Alan Greenspan in his office because he said, like, you know, the reason why, you know, sort of CTAs aren't doing as well is because of this Greenspan put, you know, so, so he provides stability in the market and downside protection, and that doesn't allow the prices to go where they want to go. So, so, but we've moved beyond the Greenspan put. And so now what we have is what, is what some could call is the Powell call in the sense is that uh, if the market is rallying now, there gives a more latitude for the Fed to continue to be hawkish. So they're going to put a uh, so they're using that as a uh, as a signal or a mechanism that allows how how hawkish they can go. If let's say that the market uh, market continues to be in a bear market then they're going to have to think about maybe sort of taking their foot off the uh, off the pedal in terms of rate rises. On the other hand, is, is that if the market is now rallying as it is now, in some sense that gives a, a latitude to some degree uh, from a financial stability point of view to be able to still continue to be hawkish, continue to raise rates. So it's, it's used as a mechanism, a signal to tell them what they're going to do. So it's they say like, if... If we rallied in the equity markets and got back to zero, which is an 18% you know, gain, this is it. We'll see that the Fed is going to be very aggressive at raising rates. So that's not going to happen because if we start to rally, then that, that gives them the latitude to do more 50 basis point increases to sort of stop inflation. Yeah. Interestingly enough, um, we were recording an episode uh, yesterday on the Allocator series with Alan. Um, and actually, uh, the guest, and I won't reveal quite who it is yet, it'll come out in, 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 uh, in a couple of weeks, 
Um, but actually, that firm, uh, which is a macroeconomic uh, research firm, um, made a call uh, not too long ago about Fed funds going to eight uh, percent. So, uh, so you might you might be right in uh, a more aggressive. Uh, uh, Jerome Powell than uh, people might uh, suspect, but I think we did pretty well on the topics. I know we could have gone on, but we are, um, you know, we always pressed for time uh, during our conversations, Mark. But I uh, really appreciate this. Um, let's wrap up the conversation for this week. If you enjoyed it, of course, then feel free to go to iTunes and Spotify, leave a rating and review, or you can share uh, the link toptradersunplugcom forward slash share with three of your friends or colleagues uh, or just people who are interested in investment uh, where you can um, help out. And um, next week, we will, of course, uh, be back. Um, I think it's Jerry that's coming back next week. So uh, we're going to be tackling some uh, hardcore trend-following topics, I'm sure. Um, make sure you uh, send in your questions uh, well ahead of time so we have a chance to prepare. Uh, email them to info at toptradersonplot.com and we do our best to uh, bring them up. Uh, you can, of course, also follow the trend barometer each day on the website, uh, as well as some other resources that we uh, have. And uh, also, you may have noticed the latest monthly trend following report that Rich and I published only a few days ago. With that, from Mark and me, thanks ever so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you next week. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.